Hey, what's up guys? Hello, from Football Talk here. As I've been working my way through the rosters of all 32 NFL teams, trying to find out their biggest remaining needs and which players I think could break out for them in 2020, I tried to look at this from a little bit of a different angle here. So I compared last year's rosters to the ones for this upcoming season and tried to figure out at every single position which team improved the most at that unit. For this exercise, I'm considering top and play as well as depth. Players coming back from injury will be weighed to a small degree, but that can obviously vary depending on how much that player actually was out there for them or if he even played at all for them. And with that being said, let's get right into the list. With the quarterbacks, I decided to go with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And I want to start it like this. As much as everybody wants to ridicule Jameis Winston for those 30 interceptions he threw last season, he did also lead the league in passing yards and tossed 33 touchdowns, so the Bucs will certainly lose some of that explosive element he brought in the passing attack, but that transition from Jameis to Tom Brady will definitely have more positives that outweigh the negatives here. Now you have that legendary quarterback at the helm, he immediately upgrades their situational football awareness, turned them into more of a well-oiled, efficient machine rather than an offense that had their bombs away mentality. It'll be an adjustment for both sides with Bruce Arians and Byron Leftwich allowing Tom Brady to spread the field a little more and take advantage of the space created with some more of the horizontal passing game. But the 43-year-old quarterback also has to be a little more willing to stand in there and take some shots off play action, more so than what he did in recent years with New England. To me, I expect the entire team to benefit from the move, however, maybe not in terms of the receivers seeing more downfield targets coming their way and be able to have more impressive stat lines. But if you can protect Brady, he's still one of the more precise passes in the NFL and in all of NFL history, which will also allow them to convert on more drives consistently. And maybe most importantly, actually, it'll benefit the defense, not put them in so many bad situations, offshore turnarounds, putting the opposing offense in scoring range already and just not expecting the defense to be out there for so many plays and get tired that way. Looking at the backup quarterback, Blaine Gabbard is definitely going to be labeled as a bust since he certainly never lived up to that status as a top 10 draft pick, especially when you look at J.G. Watt going one spot behind him in that loaded 2011 draft. But he's been a solid backup these last few years and he's already worked with Arians in Arizona where I thought he performed much better than the stats would indicate being put in a very tough situation and that's why I think he brought him in a year ago and then re-signed him this offseason despite missing almost all of 2019 with a dislocated shoulder. The Buccaneers they also still have last year's back at Ryan Griffin who has been sticking around for a while now in Tampa but he's only thrown four passes in the regular season since entering the league in 2013 so having Gabbard with more experience and understanding that offense as well that will definitely be an upgrade and in the end they are replacing Jameis with Brady and then they get Gabbard back for free. So that's definitely a big improvement. The other team I considered here was the Indianapolis Colts, since they retain Jacoby Brissett, but also bring in Philip Rivers, and then they draft Jacob Eason in the fourth round. So that room altogether looks a lot better. Still have Jack Keller there, whose talent I believe in a lot, but he has yet to see the field in regular season. All right, let's move on to the running backs here, and I went with the Washington Redskins. And this is not meant to be an insult by any means, I believe a 35-year-old running back still being as effective as he is, that is absolutely an accomplishment. Uh, but for Adrian Peterson to make up for 57% of the team's rushing yards at this point of his career, and him almost picking up twice the yardage of all the other backs on the roster combined, to me that's just not a recipe for success. AP is an all-time great, and I think he can still contribute to the running back room. Not only his ability to lead the young guys, but also he can be put on the field and be effective. But at the same time, I just believe the Redskins need to put more young talent out there to give them a boost. What really stands out now when you look at the Washington roster and the running back position in particular is just how many buddies they have. You look at the acquisitions they made in former Tampa Bay Buccaneer Peyton Barber as a solid tough ball carrier. Then they also bring in JD McKissick, has the ability to catch the ball in space, run away from people with track speed almost. That's already pretty good, but the main ad here for me is third round pick Antonio Gibson who actually primarily played slot receiver in college for Memphis, but he has that explosiveness and the contact balance that you want to see if you want to project him to the running back position. He only really ran two plays at Memphis out of the backfield from those two back sets, like a stretch play to the outside and then a power where he started back inside. But whenever the Tigers put him back there, good things seem to happen, has the ability to bounce off tackles, 
but also produce big plays in the run game or when you get the ball to him out of the backfield. With new offensive coordinator Scott Turner being brought in, I think he will use that skill set a lot, either on fly sweeps, creating mismatches out of the backfield, or just a decoy for the defense, where you fake those fly sweeps to him maybe, and then just have him binding uh, defenders on the backside, or being motioned around and giving a little run fake to him. And while I don't want to talk too much about the previously injured players, I think in this situation in particular, I can't ignore what the Redskins are bringing back, especially with a guy like Darius Geis, who I had as my number two running back coming out two years ago behind only Saquon Barkley, who was obviously in tier of his own. But for Geis, I just loved how angry he was running the ball, that natural feel for the position. He really showed some signs in preseason two years ago, but then I think against the Patriots it was um, towards ACL and was lost for the season. And then last year, plays five games, but then gets put on IR again. When he was out there last season, however, he averaged 5.8 yards per carry, and he got involved in the passing game, which is something that people wanted to doubt coming out of college with LSU. Until last season when Joe Brady came in, that was just not what these guys did. You look at Flan Fournette as well, same question with him. Just not the offense, but in the few limited reps he's had, he's looked like a pretty solid pass catcher as well. And the X factor in this entire group to me is a guy who was a Heisman Trophy runner-up in 2017, in Bryce Love coming out of Stanford, had a disappointing season after that with a weakened O-line in front of him, and he has yet to see the field for Washington. But when he was out there in 2017, he was the master of those 20 plus yard breakaway runs. And if he's back to full health finally again, I think he can be a contributor as well. As far as the losses go, you only have Chris Thompson here, who to be fair was a very good third down back, but I think he can somewhat compensate for the departure with some other guys combining to fill that role. The other team I want to mention is the Dolphins, and uh, two very solid committee backs in Jordan Howard and Matt Breida, but not quite to the level that the Redskins did. Alright, let's move on to the wide receivers, and I went with the Denver Broncos. I could have gone a couple of different routes here, and this is actually the one with the least proven players at the pro level, but I just see so much talent in Denver. And I want to start out like this. Cortland Sutton, to me, is one of the young star receivers in the league, and he's still growing. So the Broncos really only needed one more piece to that group, since to me, Deshaun Hamilton, not a bad option in the slot. And a lot of their production was going to come through their backs and first round tight end Noah Fant from a year ago. So after they were able to just sit there in the middle of the first round and have Jerry Judy from Alabama land right into the lap, who to me was the premier route runner in this draft, that ankle breaking ability. After they were able to get him coming out of Alabama, I thought the team was able to focus on more other areas of the team. But instead, in the second round, they come back and they draft another receiver, can open a jitterbug with the ball in his hands in KJ Hamler. He might have had some drop issues at Penn State last season, but he's tremendous at tracking the deep ball after blowing past safeties. And he's really tough to put a hand on uh, with the ball in his hands in space. So having Judy at that piece, they can move around the formation, line up in different spots and create separation with the way he sets up his breaks. That will be a major help already for the second year quarterback, Drew Locke. And now you have Hamler as well, who will only help out because not only does Locke have that big arm to attack downfield and get the ball to him, streaking past defenders, but he also opens up the offense a little more as teams have to roll coverage in a certain way. And now maybe you have, you have Judy being one-on-one, -on -one just fooling a defender with a double move against man coverage. Or you put the two rookies to one side and you have Sutton on the other side, maybe with a one-on-one -on -one created for him as well. And he can win with his physicality as a route runner. That's already a lethal core of pass catchers all of a sudden. And I haven't even talked about the tight ends with Noah Fant being a vertical target as well. Detached from the line at times. And then the fourth round, Albert Okwikbunam from Missouri. He's teaming up back with his quarterback from the year before that, who actually he was the most productive with. The Broncos can run a lot of 12 personal sets and create issues that way with three legitimate options to go along with it at the receiver position. We look at the losses for Denver. The really only guy they lost was Emmanuel Sanders, who they traded mid-season. And I'm not going to talk anything bad about him because the recovery he made and how well he played actually for them and the Niners, it was remarkable. But at this stage of his career, I don't think he's as dynamic as the two other rookies will be. Plus, then in the seventh round, the Broncos get another true burner in Tyree Cleveland, who is good for a couple of deep balls next season if he makes that roster. And he can contribute on special teams, especially in the return game. So if he can establish a role that way, he will also see some balls on offense. And overall, this entire crew is so much more explosive now.
the other two teams I considered here, the Buffalo Bills, trading for Stephon Diggs and then investing some draft picks as well into the wide receiver position and the Philadelphia Eagles, who basically went all in on receiver and draft, headlined by Jalen Reagan in the first round, and then also trading a fifth round pick for Marquise Goodwin from the 49ers, who was actually an Olympic sprinter. They desperately lacked that speed element late last season, and that's what they improved upon. But now let's move on to the tight ends, and I'm gonna go with the Cleveland Browns here. On paper, when you look at this roster, you see a former first round pick who only turned 23 a couple weeks ago, and recorded over a thousand receiving yards and eight touchdowns through his first two years. You wouldn't have thought that the Browns might be in the market for really a big time number one tight end, but despite that, they went out and they made Austin Hooper the highest paid tight end in the league when it comes to annual salary. I took out of the equation Hunt Henry of the Chargers since he's only on the franchise tag, not a multi year deal. But for Hooper, he was a major beneficiary from the Dirk Cutter tight end happy offense in Atlanta when he almost reached the 800 yard mark and got to the end zone six times, despite missing three games due to injury. But even before that, he had shown improvement every single year when it comes to receptions, yards, and the catch percentage. And he only dropped one of 97 targets last season. If he just had him and then David Njoku, who was expected to make a big jump already last season, that is a really good duo that can create some problems for defenses. You put those two guys on either end of the line on like ace sets, and release them off play action, that can be a problem for the opposition. But then Cleveland in the draft, early on day three, they also add FAU's Harrison Bryant. And while I have some questions about his ability to be a factor as an inline blocker and how his catch radius limits some of the things he can do, he can certainly stress defenses down the seams and he's dangerous slipping out off play action into the flats or on deeper crosses. Now with Kevin Stefanski coming in as the new head coach and bringing in that offense he ran in Minnesota, Cleveland will run a lot of 12 personnel, and while those guys won't necessarily blow people off the ball in the run game, they all have the athleticism to at least secure the edges and allow Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt to get their corner more routinely on outside zone plays. Plus, they don't lose much when they drop back compared to if they had another receiver on the field. You look at the stats from last season, the Browns do lose their two leading receivers at the tight end position in Ricky Seals Jones and Demetrius Harris. But those two guys combined for just 378 yards. Hooper more than doubled that in 13 games last season. And while it's obviously a big jump from Conference USA to the NFL, Bryant did crack the 1000 yard mark, which is something that you see very rarely in college. With Njoko trying to re-establish himself coming off injury, this could easily be the best trio of Titans in the entire league to me. The two other teams I considered here, the Chicago Bears, they signed Jimmy Graham, who is definitely an aging player but can still contribute in the red zone. And while I think they reached a little bit, in the second round they drafted the consensus number one tight end in Notre Dame's Cole Komet. And then the Seahawks adding Greg Olson, a veteran who's been there for a while, plus a couple other guys in the draft. And then they get back some guys who they've lost to injury. That will definitely be a better unit as well. And now let's look at the offensive line. I went with the Miami Dolphins here. And there were a few ways I could have gone here. I went through all the rosters. And there were a good 10 teams that I think will probably at least have two new starters compared to what they had in 2019, or they just drafted multiple offensive linemen. And while I believe the Giants and Browns have added better players to fill out the O-line, for the Dolphins it really came down to volume and who they had on the roster originally. So let me just redo their starting five from a year ago. At left tackle, after they traded away Laramie Tunsil, they had Julian Davenport, left guard Michael Dieter, center Daniel Kilgore, right guard Evan Bohm, and right tackle Jesse Davis. That's a very underwhelming group. And for the casual NFL fan, they probably couldn't name a single one of them or have even heard from more than one of them. I liked Dido quite a bit coming out of Wisconsin a year ago, had him as my 76th overall prospect in the draft, and he should be the one guy to keep his starting job, even though he might swap sides. But there's a pretty good chance that the Finns will have four new guys around him. Kilgore and Boom are the two guys that have walked this offseason, but they added so many quality pieces here. First, before we get to acquisitions, they got back Danny Isidora, who they traded early on in 2019, and whose potential I liked quite a bit coming out of Miami a few years ago, but he went on IR after just three weeks. And as far as the guys they have added in free agency, signing Ted Karras, who filled in very well for David Andrews in New England last season, and then Eric Flowers, who has been a punch bag in the NFL for a while now, and he's definitely gonna be labeled as a first round bust. But when you look at him last season, he actually played his best year yet. 
as a full-time starter at left guard for Washington, been responsible for just two and a half sacks. So maybe that transition to the inside really benefits him here. And those were already positive steps. But then in the draft, the Dolphins went all in on the offensive line after securing their franchise signal caller in two attack of Aloha, fifth overall. 18th overall, they select Austin Jackson, USC tackle. I thought he was a little overrated in his entire draft process because there are some concerns with the power he brings as a run blocker and some of the balance issues I see in protection. But the talent is obviously there and he could develop into a quality starter for them. But then early in the second round, they drafted one of my favorites out there in Louisiana's Robert Hunt, who was all in the run game for the Raging Cajuns at that right tackle spot, but he needed to clean up some of the footwork if he wanted to stay on the edge to sustain that success as a pass protector. I'm not sure if he even allowed the sack last season, but definitely very good. Obviously a big jump in level of competition. And then they came back on day three of the draft and they get another huge man in Georgia guard Salman Kindley. Assuming they put Jackson on the blind side day one, since I definitely believe he's an upgrade over Davenport. Then they started two free agency acquisitions to complement the inside with Michael Dieter, bringing in Karras and Flowers. And then they bookended it on the right side with Robert Hunt, who I thought would be better suited to play inside actually, but has been very effective on the right tackle spot. This starting five all of a sudden looks much better and they have some depth behind it as well. Like I mentioned, two other teams I considered here, the New York Giants, at least added one new starter in fourth overall pick Andrew Thomas and I like a couple other guys they drafted in a developmental tackle from UConn in Matt Peart and then Oregon guard Shane Lemieux. But year one, they might only have one new starter and then the Browns, I love the two tackles they picked up. Jack Conklin for a very reasonable deal in free agency coming over from the Titans. And then 10th overall, they select Alabama's Chadwick Wills, my clear number one tackle, fourth overall prospect. So they definitely strengthened that unit as well. Now let's move on to defense. And for edge rush, I went with the Buffalo Bills here. Buffalo is coming off their first double-digit win season since the turn of the millennium, and they went into the offseason with two major areas they wanted to address. On offense, it was wide receiver, and on defense, it was the edge rush. General manager Brand Bean used their first-round pick to acquire a proven commodity in Stefan Diggs from Minnesota, who matches up really well with the big-armed quarterback Josh Allen. You look at what he did already in Minnesota with Kirk Cousins, who's probably looked at more as a conservative passer, even though the numbers would suggest otherwise. But a lot of that obviously had to do with Diggs streaking open on post routes or deep overs of play action. And I think that's exactly what he can do with the Bills as well. But as far as the edge rush goes, they had already signed a very underrated defensive end, in my opinion, in former Carolina Panther Mario Addison. He's actually finished with nine plus sacks in each of the last four seasons. But when this team was finally on the clock in the middle of the second round, they got one of the biggest deals of the draft, in my opinion, in Iowa's A.J. Panessa, which I thought would have been a target for them with that original first round pick at 22nd overall, and I had him ranked right in that range. Leading up to the draft, there was some speculation that Epinesa would be put in a free tech role, since he measures in at 6'5", 275 pounds, and had a pretty underwhelming combine for an edge player, which is probably also the reason he fell that far even. But with the Bills already having top 10 pick at Oliver from a year ago, he's best suited to play that spot. So to me, Epinesa projects best as a strong side defensive end in a 4-3 anyway, because I love his ability to anchor against the run, the length he presents, how well he uses his hands already, coming out of college as a junior. In terms of the losses for the Bills, Shaq Lawson, he was definitely an improving player who the prior regime used the first round pick on but he's never quite lived up to that draft pick and he did ultimately sign for 10 million annually with Miami, replacing him with Addison for the same amount of money on a frontal contract which you can get out of next year already if they wanted to. That's an upgrade for sure. And then Lorenzo Alexander, his retirement also throws up some questions here. Since he was basically the starting sandbacker over the last four years, the only games he didn't officially get that start, the defense began the game in nickel packages and it was the best stretch of his entire career. They brought him down to the edge on oversets at times or used him as a rush end on sub packages. But he's 37 years old now and with the other paces they have brought in, plus the two really good stand-up linebackers and Tremaine Edmonds and Matt Milano. The biggest loss with a guy like Alexander is the leadership he brings. The bill still of Jerry Hughes, who I think is one of the more underappreciated players in the entire league. And then a 16 game starter for them in Trent Murphy who was the returning leader in total pressures from a year ago. There was some speculation that they might move on from him, 
but at least they could flip him for some late round picks. So that entire crew to me just went up a notch. The only other team I really considered here, the Atlanta Falcons, basically replacing Vic Beasley with Dante Fowler, spending an early second round pick on Auburn's Marlon Davidson, who might play inside for them primarily, but can rush off the edge, and then taking a gamble in the form of first round pick in Charles Harris from Miami. They have the potential to take another step, especially when you look at the sack output they had a year ago. Now let's move more to the interior. And for this group, I have the Dallas Cowboys. This was probably the easiest pick from this entire breakdown. I'll mention a couple of AFC North teams at the bottom, uh, which I think definitely upgraded. But when you look at all the additions the Cowboys have made, nobody really comes close to them. You can argue that the two guys they brought in in free agency, Gerald McCoy and Dontari Poe, who curiously will be teammates once again after lining up next to each other in Carolina a year ago. You could say that they have peaked already in their respective careers, but they're both former high first round picks with a lot to like still. McCoy can still get upfield as a free tech and be a disruptor both in the run and pass game. He hasn't put up less than five sacks in any season since he missed the majority of his second year in the league. And he actually earned the highest grade among all the players on the Panthers defense last season by Pro Football Focus with the entire unit definitely falling off over the second half of the season. Can you guess who finished right behind him? It was Don Terry Poe, who only played 39% of the defensive snaps as more of a designated run stopper, but his four sacks actually were the highest mark he had put up since 2014. Despite missing five games, at the very least, he should be a rock in the middle, draw double teams at that shade nose. Those two should immediately upgrade the run defense that ranked in the middle of the league last season, keep those two fast-flowing linebackers clean, and give them a boost in the pass game as well, with only 5 sacks actually coming from the defensive tackle position in 2019 for Dallas. They would have certainly liked to retain Malik Collins, who was responsible for 4 of those 5 sacks last season, but he hadn't shown great improvements in this rookie campaign, even if he's still pretty young. But with that being said, we're not done with the acquisitions on the defensive interior, and neither was Jerry Jones. In the draft, he went back to the Oklahoma well for a second time in round 3, because he had already used the top pick on wide receiver C.D. Lamb. And then in that third round, they select Neville Gallimore, who was my 41st overall prospect on the board. His production was limited by the amount of stunts and games the Sooners ran up front, as well as playing out of position mostly, because he was an undersized nose tackle for them. But while he definitely needs to be a little more efficient with his pass rush moves, less hand fighting than actually clearing the arms of the blocker, the talent and the potential are obviously there. Super athletic, quick play on the inside. And when you let a guy like that work with a maniac like Jim Tonsula as his D-line coach, he will soon be a force on the inside for them. Early on he might not play major snaps, but he will have his role in sub packages. And maybe a year from now we're talking about him as the top interior D-lineman for the Cowboys. Like I mentioned before already, two AFC North teams that are considered here. The Cincinnati Bengals, bringing in DJ Reader to swallow up blocks and free everybody else up. And then drafting Khalid Kareem in the fourth round, who is actually an edge player, could be a strong set defensive end for them. But I've seen him slide inside on third downs as a rush D tackle as well. I think he could fill some of that role for the Bengals. And then for the Ravens, obviously trading for Calais Campbell, who was a defensive player of the year candidate just like two years ago. And then signing Derek Wolf, a very underrated player on the D-line as well. Plus in the draft, they get Justin Matabuke from Texas and m who I think is a very talented player as well. They've certainly made some moves after Derrick Henry had all that success against them in the divisional round. And now we're going to look at the second level of defense with the linebackers. And I chose the Arizona Cardinals here. Similar to the interior D-line, there weren't a lot of teams I considered in this linebacker discussion. Since you look at teams like the Ravens who I just talked about, they'll have two rookies starting on the inside as much as I like them. And I wanted at least some proven commodities. And then the Raiders, they definitely were a candidate here as well, because they went deep into the pockets and basically added two new starters. But to me, the one team that best combined young talent and established players was the Cardinals. And let's not dance around the big name. Eighth overall pick, Isaiah Simmons. He's an athletic freak and really closest to the idea of positionless football because of the skill set he presents. After he ran sub 4-4 and just jumped out of the gym at the combine, he basically dropped the mic and said, go back to my tape, you've seen it all, I can run around and make plays for you. He was used all over the field for the Tigers, showing the range of a free safety, the explosive tackling skills of a linebacker, and the length of an edge rusher. He was truly a unique prospect coming out. Now it's time to put it all on the NFL field for him, 
And I'll be interested to see how defensive coordinator Vance Joseph is going to utilize him. Right now, when I look at this defense, I think he'll be a cleanup player in the sense that they added so many bodies on the interior as well to clog up lanes and force ball carriers to bounce outside. And then you have Simmons with that blinding speed to cut them off, take away those angles and stop the ball carriers. But before the draft even started, the Cardinals also already signed free agent Devondre Campbell, who had started 54 of 59 career games with the Falcons and increased his tackling output every single year while also rarely missing on those tackles until last season when that entire unit really struggled. In base sets, I think Sims' ability to cover space matches up beautifully with one of the more underrated linebackers in the league already in Jordan Hicks. And if they want to count the more heavy personnel in that division, which makes some sense, they can go to more overfronts with three stand-up backers and then Chandler Jones on the edge, which would allow them to put Campbell out there, or at least he should be an excellent backup. Plus, then signing another free agent, Devon Kennard, who they can put at Sam and allow their best pass rusher to come off the weak side from a wide nine alignment more often. That helps as well. So I think with the acquisitions they have made, they've given themselves some flexibility, some more depth, and a potential superstar in the making in Simmons. On the other hand, you look at the three guys they lost. Terrell sucks. he was 37, and he made an impact for the Super Bowl winning Chiefs, but he's far from an every down player at this point of his career. Cassius Marsh, he will now be on his fifth team since 2017, and then Brooks Reed, he played less than 7% of the snaps. So all in all, I definitely think they took a step up. Okay, now let's move on to the secondary, and I'm going to start out with the cornerbacks. I picked the Miami Dolphins. Because when you look at those Dolphins cornerbacks with the highest snap count last season, outside of Eric Rowe, who to me should be more of a matchup piece anyway than an actual starter, the two next names will be Nick Needham and Jordan Wiltz. Similar to what I talked about with Dolphins O-line earlier already. These aren't necessarily names the general public is familiar with, and unless those guys get a chance to start for another team shortly, that won't change anytime soon. Needham in particular, I think he had a really solid stretch, at some point last season, and he should be a quality backup for them. But Wilts, he's already off the roster altogether, and the upgrades the Dolphins have made from those guys, who, to be fair, helped them win some games down the stretch last season. But you look at the acquisitions they have made, that's an astronomical jump they're gonna make in 2020. First, they made former Cowboy Byron Jones the highest paid corner in all of football, and while he may never put up big numbers in terms of interceptions, He's delivered some very sticky coverage over his last two years, allowing 7.6 and then only 5.1 yards per target these last two seasons respectively. Those numbers are actually better than the ones of Jalen Ramsey, for example. And then with that third pick in the first round at 30th overall, Miami selected Auburn's Noah Ekbenagany, who has played full-time on defense for only two years now, but he's already shown a lot of promise thanks to the athletic skill set he offers. And now to get back their original star corner, Nick Xavier Howard from IR, that could give them one of the premier cornerback trios going forward. What's intriguing to me for these three guys is that they all offer a different skill set. And that's how Brian Flores wanted to put together his secondary anyway. Similar to what he did in New England. You have Jones as that lanky, athletic corner who can get into the face of bigger receivers and not be taken advantage of at the catch point. You have Ick Benagany, definitely has a lot of room to grow. And he didn't play in the slot a lot in college, but he'll probably be the starting nickel as a rookie. Right now those rapid feet and that fluid lower body, those things can really save him, even if he takes a wrong step at times. And then Howard, he can play press or off, has that tremendous ability to click and close, which led to him tying for the lead league in interceptions in 2018. To me that entire defense with Flores, it's really starting to take shape with big bodies up front to stop the run. How versatile linebackers and that secondary with a lot of different matchup pieces. These guys should take a big step after finishing dead last in points a lot a year ago. The two other teams I thought about here, the Bengals adding two starters from Minnesota and Trey Waynes and Mackenzie Alexander to go with William Jackson, who I think is one of the rising stars at the cornerback position. And then the Lions drafting an elite cornerback prospect third overall in Jeffrey Okuda, bringing in Desmond Trufant from Atlanta, and then they still have Justin Coleman in the slot. Obviously they lost Darius Slay, but that was a move that was inevitable, so all in all could be a very good trio as well. And now our final position group for today, the safeties, and I went with the Cleveland Browns here. You look at this list on the right, a lot of changes being made, and in terms of who they lost from the 2019 roster, the Browns will probably be right up there on the list as well. 
you look at the top five safeties in terms of the snaps they played last season, also of 2019, fourth round pick, Sheldrick Redwine, the other four guys are now off that roster. That includes starters Demarius Randall and Morgan Burnett, who missed the combined 13 games, and then backups Jermaine Whitehead and Eric Murray. Those were all solid players in the roles they were put in, but I still believe the three guys they added this offseason equal a big net plus for them. The two major pieces here, second round pick Grant Talbot from LSU, and then they signed a former top 15 selection Carl Joseph, formerly of the Raiders. For Talbot, he's been criticized quite a bit as a tackler, and there are some claims that he took his foot off the pedal last season after he was projected to be one of the top defensive players selected in this year's draft. But I never thought his tackling was due to a lack of effort, but rather just coming in too hot and trying to stop a receiver after catching the ball quickly. And he just didn't break down in space or whatever it may be. And I believe you put him in that deep middle safety role where he can make a lot of plays on the ball in between the numbers because of the range and length he presents. I think he'll be one of the more productive rookie defenders in the league. And then you have Carl Joseph, who complements that skill set very well, since he's the guy who will be playing close to the line of scrimmage. Maybe lack some size for that role, but his ability to elude blockers, that good mix of secure tackling, but also the ability to just knock somebody out. He never lived up to the draft status with the Raiders, but he's shown improvement throughout his four years in Oakland and actually enjoyed his best season yet in 2019 especially in coverage. I understand why the Raiders didn't want to make a big effort to re-sign him since they're getting back a guy that they really loved coming out of last year's draft and spent the first round pick on Jonathan Abram. But for the Browns to get that 26-year-old on a bargain deal for one year, two and a half million, that is pretty darn good. With the two young corners they have in Cleveland, Joseph having an ability to match up with backs or tight ends, and then you have Delpit back there roaming around I think we'll see a lot of single high safety coverage for the Browns. And they also signed a former Viking in Andrew Zandejo, who will be a high quality backup for them with plenty of starting experience, mostly in split safety looks, which you could use if Dalpert is not available maybe, or you can fill in a strong safety if Joseph is banged up. So overall that trio and the entire defense as a whole, I think they could be one of the top 10 units this season and the safeties could play a big role in that. The two other teams I considered here, the Lions bringing in former Patriot Ron Harmon and then Will Harris who will be a solid backup for them as well. Or they can go to more free safety looks, which Patricia probably wants to do anyway coming over from New England. And then the Panthers selecting Jeremy Chin in the second round, basically a safety with linebacker size, but tremendous range and ability to close spaces. And then later on Kenny Robinson who has starting experience in the XFL and was one of the better players there. He's actually still very young as well and is on the trajectory up. So I'm starting to like this group, even though I have questions about the cornerbacks. But that is it. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like, subscribe to the channel for more detailed breakdowns, and just share it with one friend. That'll already help a lot. You can check out more of my videos here on my YouTube channel or on my page, hellosworldfootballtalk.com. Plus, you have my social media channels linked down below in the description. I will be back next week with something I had my followers vote on on an Instagram poll. They wanted me to look at my top 10 offensive lines in the NFL heading into 2020. I really enjoyed going through all those great O-line tapes, especially after watching the 2019 Dolphins. You can always hit me up in my comments or DMs for specific video ideas, or maybe I do another poll sometime. Definitely worth checking that out. So until then, see you later. Peace.